type 2 diabetes, carbon negative concrete, chat GPT, EV batteries, etc, etc, vaccines, let's go. Unleash your potential with the Thought Bistro. Dive into business, financial and tech insights that transform you into the best version of yourself. Hit subscribe and let's get started. Taking you guys back to your childhood, Willy Wonka said it best. Very little time, lots to talk about. So let's get straight into it. So a couple of uh, accounting nerds, excuse me, a couple of inquisitive minds at BYU decided to put ChatGPT against the test. And they took the older version of ChatGPT and put it against an accounting exam. After putting it through their accounting exam, ChatGPT's score was 47.4%. A regular student who was actually preparing for the exam, their score was 76.7%. Humanity won for now. It, it's like an episode of How I Met Your Mother, Humanity versus the Machines, where Marshall Erickson runs against the cars and is unable to beat the car. Marshall versus the machine. However, they did decide to use Chad GPT instead of using GPT-4. That's like driving a wagon when you can actually drive a Mercedes. And yet the wagon did pretty decent. The authors did... Uh, Later in the discussion, the author authors do say that they fully expect GPT-4 to improve on the results. Some of the things that they did capture was that GPT doesn't always recognize when it's doing math and makes nonsensical errors. We also call this hallucination. But a later discussion. Chat GPT often provides explanations for its answers even if they are incorrect. Again, more hallucinations. And Chat GPT sometimes makes up facts, which is literally what hallucinations are. GPT-4 does fix on hallucinations, so let's see what's next. They said chat GPT does better on true and false and uh, multiple choice questions, but it struggled with short answer questions, scoring 68.7%, 59.5%, and between 28.7% and 39.1%. So if you give chat GPT options, it's better at picking out the right option than you asking it a question and expecting a perfectly cohesive, coherent answer especially when it comes to accounting. 327 co-authors from 186 educational institutions in 14 countries participated in the research. And there were 25,181 classroom accounting exam questions that they went through. And yet they used chat GPT. They could not pay $10 a month and try to use GPT-4 for their research where so many people are getting together. Can you imagine the audacity? I guess they wanted to show chat GPT in a more negative light and they figured GPT-4 is going to rain on their parade. So for all those of you who thought we're actually pointing out a negative of chat GPT, no, we're going to wax lyrical about GPT-4 instead of GPT-3.5. <laughs> Speaking about waxing lyrical, there was a tenant who managed to use chat GPT to get their washer and dryer fixed. Svetlana is the name of the tenant. It's a 28-year-old. 20, so she feared that she won't be able to get her point across by herself. So she asked AI Chatbot to act like a housing lawyer and draft an email opposing the rent raise. She says the rent increase alone was not my gripe. It was the audacity to increase the rent, seemingly in retaliation after I filed a complaint and request for a rent decrease on the basis of decreased building-wide services. So she prompted ChatGPT to act more legally. It's like a super smart, objective, real-time sounding board. ChatGPT even quoted specific sections of the New York Rent Stabilization Code and posited that the rent increase was retaliatory. Can you imagine getting an email which states, yeah, this is the legal code and a regular tenant is sending you these emails, which if you do hire a lawyer is super duper expensive to do. The landlord must, must be so scared just getting that email oh no i am so messed up the future is now my friend the future is now in a final note she says it's definitely reinforced my faith in what feels to be limitless future of ai we are living in super fun times and it's clear that we are only just scratching the surface of what's possible amen like us fawning over ai this is her fawning over ai everybody needs to fawn over ai and let's build a better future, man. 100% use AI all you can to make things work better for you. Moving from AI, there was a study done by Tufts University, which links 14 million cases of type 2 diabetes to poor diet. 
Researchers estimate 7 out of 10 type 2 diabetes cases in the world since 2018 to be linked to food choices. So a research model of dietary intake in 184 countries developed by the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University has done this study and they have taken a look at data from 1990 to 2018. So type 2 diabetes is characterized by the resistance of the body's cells to insulin. All the 184 countries included in the study saw an increase in type 2 diabetes between 1990 and 2018. They noticed that regionally central and eastern Europe and central Asia, particularly Poland and Russia where the diets tend to be rich in red meat, processed meat and potatoes, had the greatest number of type 2 diabetes cases linked to diet. This was also particularly high in Latin America and the Caribbean, especially in Colombia and Mexico, which was credited to a high consumption of sugary drinks, processed meat, and a low intake of whole grains. It's so yet again emphasizing the importance of a balanced diet. You know, you can just you think you're just having a cheat meal, and that cheat meal happens once too often, and you end up with type two diabetes. I love how there's no stress on sugar here. while sugar is meant to be the main culprit in all of this so we are right now in the process of reading a book which discusses this exact thing and the thing about how the gut health works and how the gut health affects the insulin variation in the body so we will be a lot more educated by the time we do end the book but based on our knowledge now insulin is like this magic hormone which decides how much energy your body is going to consume given how much input it is getting when we keep feeding it more and more sugar over time we become insulin resistant which means even though your insulin will be high your insulin doesn't indicate to your brain that you need to start consuming energy that inside your body and it keeps looking for outside sources for that energy to get rid of this insulin resistance you generally need to lower your insulin levels for consistently long basis one such way is to fast another such way is to eat less insulin raising foods foods that are lower on the glycemic index glycemic index indicates how much insulin bounce your body gets by consuming certain foods it's a whole episode by itself but type 2 diabetes is becoming a very very immediate and very very serious issue in a lot of maybe in all of the parts of the world and needs to be looked more carefully at needs to be taken more seriously especially given all the packaged foods that we are we are all consuming now So researchers also made some progress in figuring out what exactly causes down syndrome and how we can maybe solve that. Researchers at the University of Michigan have found that a gene involved in down syndrome puts the brakes on neurons's activity in mice. The gene in question is called the down syndrome cell adhesion molecule or the DSCAM. which is implicated in other human neurological c- conditions including people on the autism spectrum people having bipolar disorder and intractable epilepsy so they say the ideal path for treatment would be to identify the gene that causes the condition target this gene or other genes that it works with to treat that aspect of down syndrome this was said by bing ye a, sci- a neuroscientist at the um life sciences institute and the lead author of the study Speaking of down syndrome though this year's Oscars had an achievement where James Martin of Northern Ireland became the first leading actor with down syndrome to be a part of an Oscar winning film in his role in an Irish goodbye talking about more research after 8 years of research there's a world changing malaria vaccine that has been approved in Africa and while malaria is less of a concern in the newer side of the world it is still very much a concern in africa and in numerous other countries so having a vaccine ready for malaria is quite a leap for humanity i think this is also based on the mrna technique that was used for the covid vaccine if i'm not mistaken from what i remember reading about malaria vaccines they've been in production forever but ever since 2021 when the covid vaccine initially was created there has been a boost in creating vaccines for malaria hiv aids and cancer for that matter ghana and nigeria have approved it for immunization in infants between 5 months to 3 years of age one of the highest mortality groups for malaria currently the final trial data a study of r21 shots in 5000 children in burkina faso 
has been shown to various African health or drug authorities but has not been made public yet. We expect R21 to make a major impact on malaria mortality in children in the coming years and in the long term it will contribute to overall final goal of malaria eradication and elimination. These are the words of Professor Adrian Hill, director of Jenner Institute at the University of Oxford, where the vaccine was invented. Akhil, you know what time it is, right? What? It's time for Battery News of the Week. Ding, ding, ding. Battery News of the Week. So this time, our news is not about new battery technology, but about battery recycling. As you know, there are a lot of parts of the battery that can be reused. And in Covington, Georgia, a 30,000 ton per year recycling facility for batteries and battery scrap just switched on the disassembly line for the very first time. The company is called Ascend Elements and it hopes to take advantage of the massive government spending on electric vehicle production by dotting the Carolinas, Georgia, Tennessee and the Midwest with recycling facilities within an hour's drive from new automotive plants. The Covington location can take apart around 70,000 electric vehicles worth of batteries while allegedly providing enough free cash flow to allow Ascend to pay the car manufacturers a little for their old batteries to make doubly sure they don't end up in landfills. You know, numerous times you have discussion with these anti-EV people and the anti-EV people have only one argument to make that EVs are just as polluting and even if they're not as polluting now, they are going to be very polluting in the future given that we have no way of recycling batteries. And while you can say it's a future problem or it's a problem for the later part of humanity, it is very much a problem now. And getting to solve it now would really enable us to, you know, have more of a push into green energy and into more EVs and into more batteries for the houses, you know. I think it's just going to make batteries cheaper overall, man. Because all these are finite minerals. They have to be mined. They have to be taken out of some mine in some place in the world. And it's not the easiest to mine these metals. So if you can strip a existing battery, which is to run its course and use some of those metals to make new batteries, why not? Another, we're killing two, three, four birds with one stone, man. EVs are becoming cheaper. We're not polluting the earth. And we're using, you know, we're prompting people to recycle. That's amazing. There's so much happening with just one thing. So another way to achieve the same is changing the source of energy. And one such source of, source of energy which we know very little about, but we do know that it is clean and very readily available, is hydrogen. The primary problem with hydrogen is it cannot be saved. And our understanding of the element itself is pretty limited because of the limitation computational abilities that we have. With the upcoming quantum computers and a faster way to process information and do more random testing. We are able to understand hydrogen a little better now. So simulations with a machine learning model predict a new phase of solid hydrogen. This was done by Professor David Sepperly, who is a professor of physics at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He is a member of the Illinois Quantum Information Science and Technology Center and uses computer simulations to show how hydrogen atoms interact and combine to form different phases of matter like solid, liquids and gas. In order to study these phenomena properly, they required quantum mechanics and quantum mechanical simulations which were extremely costly. So they developed a machine learning technique that allows quantum mechanical simulations to be performed with an unprecedented number of atoms. So Richard Feynman, the father of quantum physics, used to say that the only limitation I have right now is our computers. It is amazing that even after all of those years, still the only limitation we have are our computers, despite how much faster they are. With quantum computers coming into the picture and with the research, just, you know, that's the next leap that we are going to have when the quantum computers become readily available. Just to put things into perspective, Richard Feynman died in 1988. We're currently in 2023. But we have made leaps and bounds in computing technology. It's been 35 years. And yeah, our understanding of hydrogen, our understanding of other elements will only help us prosper much faster as a society, as our existence becomes less of a threat. Again, the more we understand our environment and the more we're able to use the things that are made available to us by this, by the environment, 
naturally available. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe and is found everywhere from dust filling of the outer space to the cores of stars. So, yeah, I think hydrogen is a good place to start. So moving on from hydrogen to carbon, carbon as we know has been quite threatening to our global systems, something we call global warming, which is real by the way, global warming is real people. Ask anybody living in India what the heat wave that they're facing currently. Our carbon footprint determines how fast we are heating up the atmosphere and how fast global warming is going to damage us and it's going to become an, an existential crisis for us. So one of the most used substances that we have on this planet is concrete. In a proof of concept work, the researchers infused regular cement with environmentally friendly biochar, a type of charcoal made from organic waste that has been strengthened beforehand with concrete wastewater. The biochar was able to suck up 23% of its weight in carbon dioxide from the air while still reaching a strength comparable to ordinary cement. Veritasium did a video on concrete very recently. Fascinating, fascinating watch. So he talks about what concrete is and most of us don't know how concrete works or how old the workings of concrete are. But this is a step in the right direction. Per person, we use around 200 gallons of concrete per year based on how much construction happens. Concrete is used everywhere from roads to buildings to anything you can think of. It's very exciting news. And again, concrete is not recyclable, Not it doesn't really degrade very easily, which is why we use it so much. And that often proves to be a hurdle for nature, much like plastic. So here we have concrete that makes it more environmentally friendly, reduces its carbon footprint. And the paste made of the biochar amended cement was able to reach a compressive strength after 28 days comparable to that of ordinary cement about 4,000 pounds per square inch. So it's not like we're losing any strength in this carbon negative concrete. And let's hope for more and more development in this in the future because we don't seem to be slowing down in the construction area at least. We are committed to finding novel ways to divert waste streams to beneficial uses in concrete. Once we identify those waste streams, the next step is to see how we can wave the magic wand of chemistry and turn them into a resource. So this was one of the engineers that was involved in this research. It is still a proof of concept research and it's still ongoing, but exciting times. On a lighter note, Boeing developed a paper plane, which created a new record by flying the length of a football field. You know, there are those videos online where somebody throws a paper plane and the whole crowd is going, oh, and the plane is just flying through and it hits somebody in the eye on the field. Now you can hit somebody across the stadium in their eye. You just have to have an aeronautics degree that makes you capable enough to work at Boeing. I'm assuming they know a thing, thing or two about making planes. And we might also have to change the design of the paper planes that we make, which are like these stupid things which half the time they don't fly. And the other half the time they just like, you know, roll over, hit yourself in the eye. So you, maybe we get to learn a little better. For all the women out there, there's an update. There's a groundbreaking contraceptive pill for men that could be just around the corner. After scientists ad identified a gene that once removed temporarily renders sperm infertile. Crucially and exactly like the female contraceptive pill, the destabilization of the infertility protein is not permanent, meaning sperm will recover once the person or animal stops taking the pills. This is what the article says. These are not my words. You don't want to wipe out the ability to ever make sperm just to stop the sperm that are being made from being made correctly, said Dr. Oatley, senior author and professor in WSU's School of Molecular Biosciences. Then, in theory, you could remove the drug and the sperm would start being built normally again. And it's like the Scooty Pep Plus ad, why should boys have all the fun? Well, I think here both can have the fun, so. Moving on from contraceptives to cancer, trial skincare cancer vaccine, dramatically reduces melanoma relapse in patients receiving immunotherapy. A personalized skincare vaccine has almost half the risk of death or relapse in patients with the deadliest form of melanoma. The trial involved men and women who had had surgery to remove melanoma from the lymph nodes or other organs and, at were, and were at a high risk of the disease returning. About 1.3 million Americans are currently diagnosed with melanomas 
and scientists predict skin cancer will be the second most common type in the US by 2040. So this here is the Pandora's box moment for humanity. In February, the US Food and Drug Administration granted breakthrough therapy designation to help speed along a pairing of the mRNA vaccine in combination with immunotherapy drug. It triggers immune system T cells to attack tumors to spare normal cells. The system uses checkpoint molecules on T cell surfaces to turn off their attack against viruses when they are clear when they clear an infection. So I think you know with everything bad comes something good and mRNA is going to be the great that did come along with the COVID pandemic. Yeah, man, this mRNA technology is going to really revolutionize the way we make vaccines. Among the 107 patients treated with both the vaccine and immunotherapy, the cancer returned in 22.4% within of the patients within two years, compared to 20 out of 50, which is 40%, who only received the immunotherapy. I think, again, this is in very early stages. And most of the news we do bring you is very early stages. However, it's nice to see what the vision might look like, you know, what the world might look like in a few years' time and how we're able to tackle all of these major, major problems. It's nice to see that we're trying all these different things. I mean, half of these or 80% of these might not work, but it's just very interesting to read about these random bits of news which you don't see covered in headlines or on newspapers or on news networks. So yeah, we just find this supremely interesting to find these little nuggets of news here and there. And we hope that you too enjoy hearing about these. They will be covered once they become more prominent and popular. And one of those things that will become more prominent and popular by 2030 is that researchers hopeful vaccines for cancer and heart diseases will be ready by 2030. And again, these are therapies based on mRNA work by teaching cells how to make a protein that triggers the body's immune system response against specific disease. Dr. Paul Burton, the chief medical officer at Moderna, was discussing this with The Guardian, that the success of the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine accelerated the technology. Burton thinks that his pharmaceutical company will offer treatments for all sorts of disease areas by 2030 and is developing cancer vaccines targeting multiple types of tumors. By offering personalized cancer vaccines, it will save many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives. Of course, there's a lot of optimism when you talk to the chief medical officer of a company like Moderna, but they must be working on something. They were pioneers in the mRNA technology alongside Pfizer. So let's hope for a very, very bright future ahead. Thanks a lot for listening, you guys. Hope to see you in the next one. Thanks for joining us. We hope to continue to bring you some interesting news from around the world and keep you informed and keep you entertained. And hope to see you again next time. Thank you.